executive session prior to the start of this meeting for personnel matters. Uh, if we could all stand for the pledge of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, this evening, uh, we are going to start off with a uh, program report. We have uh, Mr. Rick Wegman, who is our supervisor of uh, transportation services, who will be uh, delivering that report. Mr. Wegman, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, go ahead. Okay, we'll check your mic. your mic. Okay, for this year we purchased um, 277 passenger buses and also one 54 passenger bus. Those are all in service. We also purchased one one passenger van. The plan were to trade a van in on that. Uh, we decided not to. Uh, we kept that van because uh, how the demand is for vans this year and going into the future. For next year, uh, we'd like to get actually four buses, uh, three 77 passengers, one 54 passenger, and then also a student van, and for our mail run and food delivery now, uh, for years, they have been using a student van. Uh, what I'd like to do in the future is actually get a cargo van in place of a student van so that we actually would have that van to use in our fleet for students. So uh, that's what the, the high roof line cargo van would be for. Um, again, there has to be discussion on that yet, what food services needs are, where they will be going. But to me, it's one way to free up a passenger student van. Yeah. We have 50 buses in the fleet. Um, so we try to keep them 15 years. So every four or five years, instead of three buses, you know, I'll propose to get four. And that's why I have four for this year. You know, we are trading in different used buses for all those those vehicles. Uh, a little bit about bands. With the curriculum changes in the senior high school, they now need a van every day. They start with it a little bit after 7 o'clock. So that is a van that is not available to us at all uh, for anything else until after 2 o'clock. They would also like a second van on some days. Um, that pretty well uses up the availability. I have listed just briefly some of the things that we get requests for vans you know, from other staff members. Um, so I would like to increase the amount of vans that we have available uh, between athletics, curriculum changes, what other staff members need vans for periodically. Um, and actually I would like to leave Two of them actually park at the high school. We don't have room at the bus garage. So have two of them parked at the senior high school that they're more available for these curriculum special ed classes. They don't have to run to the bus garage every day to pick one up to run back and forth. The one van that we did get this year, um, it didn't put us ahead any because of our driver shortage. We did have one route that I had a bus on that actually the students would fit in a van. So I put a van on that run, took the, the bus off of it, which gave me another CDL driver to use on a different route. So briefly, that's um, vehicle purchases for the next school year um, that I would like. If by chance it was available to get another student van this school year, 
and that would help tremendously. So, um, again, that's a decision for the board. The information that I gave you, I have uh, fleet information. That is sorted by the capacity of the buses. The start mileage is July 1 mileage. You'll see some of the numbers, the bus numbers have an asterisk beside it. Those are buses that have surveillance cameras in them. We have 34 outfitted now. All the buses that serve the Exeter students have them, and quite a few of the spares that we would use for the Exeter students also have their surveillance on the same. I also included the mileage that we ran last year. Um, it's listed by vehicle number. The mileage is a little bit less than the previous year, but we only ran 178 school days instead of 181. So that would tend to be why some of that mileage is a little bit shorter. The school trip requests were up. Uh, most of that was the extra special ed curriculum classes that needed bands. And athletic trips, they were down to, so they basically stayed about the same. I also gave you information on the students that we transported last year. This is what I used to uh, fill out the data for the state report. I have a 16 and 17 uh, information there. The second page of that is how I derive the numbers. Um, all the routes are listed with the numbers that are actually on the list. And I also gave you the 15 16 if you want to compare to the year before. To give you a school directory of the, the schools that we are transporting to um, every day. There are some schools that we contract out to contractors, so that's not every school that um, people who live in Exeter are going to, but it, it is the ones that we are transporting to. And then last, I have given you the route assignments, the drivers, and the the different ways that I have the schools paired on the different routes. Presently, we have five open routes that we substitute for every day. Every early dismissal, that grows by two um, because we have uh, two buses. That one does a Berks Christian and a uh, Jacksonville Elementary is the English second language. The other one does a Brooks Catholic and uh, overflow students uh, that go to Lawton. Um, on early dismissal days when we have to be at the elementary at 2.30, I also have to be at either Brooks Christian or Brooks Catholic at 2.30. Uh, that's the reason why those groups are open, and that gives us seven on those days to go in. Um, we have had drivers, uh, people inquire about driving, uh, we haven't had much success in getting drivers. It doesn't seem to be a job that everybody wants anymore. It's not a very desirable job. Um, we do have one person who's taking a driving test now. That will help. About three or four said they were going to the school to get their school hours in. It just finished this past week. so. We'll see if they follow through and get the permits that we can start training them in the bus. And if they all come through, that will help tremendously. But uh, historically, it's all over the summer. Uh, it doesn't seem to be happening. So that's what I have. Uh, any questions? Uh, this is the second year in a row in terms of buying uh, 77 passenger buses and trading in 90 passenger buses. Is, is that a long-term trend? Yes, we have very few of the 90s left. Um, 
when enrollment started dropping, the, the 90s are very expensive to purchase and uh, to maintain. We found out they're very expensive to maintain. Um, at the time when they put the emissions on, 2007 was the first emissions, and that's when they uh, told us there would be a $7,500 increase just because of emissions. Uh, that's when we started going to 81 passengers. And then as enrollment still is declining, we went to 77. 77, everyone can bid for. Uh, every manufacturer can meet that spec. Some of those other specs kind of limited to just one manufacturer. Thank you. Um, Mr. Oreck, uh, how have you ever explored um, propane buses? I mean, as far as I think, I think the diesel is is far more far more expensive, and also I don't think it's as good for the environment as what propane buses are. No. Do you have any concern about propane buses that you are constantly? range that uh, a diesel bus has. I, I know, I think the contractor for Hempfield um, went to all propane, but they needed to keep diesel buses for their long trips because the propane doesn't have the miles, they don't get the miles per gallon. Um, we've had people show us propane. Um, that was only one manufacturer. There are more players in it now. Um, <coughs> that might be the future. I don't know. With all the emissions that they've put on diesel buses, they burn very thin. They, they can't have that wrap on, on the new diesel motors that they're, they're dirty. Isn't propane more efficient than diesel? <clears throat> well, that, 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 could, that could be, but you don't have the miles per gallon. Uh, instead of having seven miles to the gallon, you're going down to three and a half, four miles to the gallon. Very similar to what the gasoline motors were when we decided to go diesel. Mm -hmm. So you, you lose your efficiency that way. So the fuel might cost less, um, but you're getting fewer miles per gallon for it. Well, I would like maybe that the our district explore that, at least to have some people from the propane industry that, are, that do this, or some school districts that do it, and you know, maybe we can, you know, maybe we'll see a different thing. Yeah, we had someone here, uh, I think it's Rhodes Energy. Mm -hmm. um, we had them here, and they talked to us. They, they showed us, and we saw a bus. Um, the engine, the engine was what they put in um, the large pickups, uh, you know, and you get to drive it empty. You, you don't get, get to drive it full with the full the, the 50 high school students on. Um, but it, the, the, it is there in the future, and, but it would be an investment. <clears throat> right now, our present location, we don't have room to add anything like another fueling tank. Um, the, the other thing that, in the discussion with them, they have three or four people trained to fuel the buses. So what it did, it added more full-time people to their staff. Not everyone is trained to fuel those buses. So there's pros and cons to everything. Well, I'm just concerned more about the environment than, um, and, and that's, I mean, I think that's the way a number of school districts are going, and I, I, you know, I'd like to maybe hear from them to see that kind of thing. Yeah, and I'd like to hear from their 30 have five years under the belt. I don't like to hear every one or two years. Yeah. You know, I'd like to hear if they have five. Yeah, hey, I agree with you. Rick, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, regarding right now, you said we're trying to get our buses out in roughly 15 years of life before we try to get rid of them. 
And I know previously we were always looking at the life expectancy against reimbursements from the state. And apparently there's a formula that starts diminishing at a certain point. Have they adjusted that because vehicles are lasting longer? Or where are we at with our reimbursement now? Uh, to my knowledge, it's still 10 years. And that's why after 10 years, and we try to get them to use spare buses. Because okay. you get reimbursed for group buses. The, the buses that, your vehicles that are transporting students to and from school. That's where you're, you're getting the reimbursement for. So yep. it's not, it's not 100%. I mean, we spent a lot of money rebuilding a motor in an older bus. That's the only way we could use it. Well, to get our money out of that bus, it's going to stay on route. Um, you mentioned that we got one van, you're hoping we get another van. How are we doing as far as, I would imagine that would also help for moving students to various locations or smaller teams for sports, whether it be the bowling team or something like that, or how are we doing with now that our bowling team has to go to the other side of Reading to play? You know, I don't have numbers yet for how many actually have to be transported. And the other, the other issue there, the, the coach won't be available to drive the van. So if we have to put a driver in it, um, it possibly it would be a van. If, if we only have six students that we have to transport, and there's a van available, yeah, that's the most economical way to do it. But, uh, we, we don't have those numbers yet. With regards to our van drivers, obviously they probably don't need to have CDLs. Is there a way of getting more movement I mean, more of the availability of getting drivers or non-CL uh, get vans operational in various routes for our longer routes where it's just one or two children, or are we already doing that right now? We're already, we're already doing that. And regarding our surveillance in our buses right now, you mentioned we have 34. Does that cover our complete fleet, or are we still lacking at this point? No, the fleet's 50. Excuse me? Our fleet is so we're still looking. We still need about 16 more yeah. coverage. Yeah, to have absolutely every bus. Have you had many incidences in the past year with unruly <coughs> children in our buses <laughs> of major levels? That's that's daily. But, uh, <laughs> but what you need surveillance for uh, sometimes it's very helpful. It's just it's very time consuming to find what's going on, you know, to sit and watch the tape, and right now we're having problems. They updated the, the software, and now we're having problems downloading it. And depending on how much time they want to get that on a different device to get to the, the principals to see it, we're running a little bit of a problem with that. But Is that something that Joe Way takes care of you for the transfer? He helped me. Him and Sheldon helped tremendously. But the one issue we only Thank you. Just one question. If you, uh, if, have you had any inspirations about the driver problem? I mean, is there something we could do to enhance that position, in your opinion, that would help to attract more people? I, we did lose a few people because they needed benefits. Okay. And, that's, and, a, that's a whole other yeah, yeah, yeah. expense. Right. And so uh, unless you were able to actually use them eight hours a day, that's, that's the only thing left. And, and and obviously it's a great need out there, and it would be it would be something that I think would attract people. There's no doubt about that. And we aren't the only right person. Everyone in the state. In fact, it's actually nationwide. Yeah, I understand that. We have the same problem with substitute teachers, but there's there, at, at some point there's got to there's got to be some sort of an answer. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I, you know, uh, do the drivers? Do we have drivers that have benefits or no? Or there are none? Okay. Do the uh, not health benefits? Not health. Just to yes. You. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty much what I meant. To tag into what Russ said, when we're looking at the other school districts that are local, do their drivers that are working for private companies have benefits typically, or are they also just standard hourly? In Burst County, not to my knowledge. I think if you go towards Philly, there you might have some that do, but not Burst County. 
Daniel yeah, Boone is the same type of condition. No, yeah, the contract, I don't know of any contract reserve. Because it's only Wilson and, and us who own our own bonds. <laughs> yeah. But with the contractors, they're in for a profit. You know. But the IU, I was just to say, yeah. the IU, we have uh, the same problem attracting drivers, but we did lay on some incentives, and I'll be seeing on Thursday night, and uh, I'll see exactly what it is. I know it, it wasn't much, but it uh, gave us a little bit of a boost. So uh, I'll uh, get you a way of what those incentives are, and we as a board can consider them. I, I think one of the things that we need to do, if there's any way that we can differentiate ourselves from the rest of the market, I, I, I think that may be a that may be a pool uh, to at least provide a few more drivers. We can give them blue baseball caps. <laughs> That's it. Tour those new dugouts. Uh, now, Mr. Wigman, I know that most of our students are transported here to the school district, but how many buses go to other places? Um, in the county, to, to, to you know, private schools or to Catholic schools or you know, to down to Hot uh, Town or wherever they go. Right here. If you look at the bus route assignment, uh, the last part I gave you, that shows the, the different schools that we're going to. Very last part. Um, we do have some that are paired. With St. Catharines is paired with Exeter routes, so we actually are double there. Yeah. 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 So that's what they go down to Westchester, I see. Mm -hmm. And we have most of the parochial schools. Right, what does the rating mean when I'm seeing that next to the various bus numbers? That's the, the pay. The, the rating is an hour and a half. Okay. Or 2.75. Mm -hmm. they, they don't punch in and out the clock, so all the routes are rated. Okay. So Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I just follow up on that? Rick had mentioned about the need for, well, next year he has on here for two student vans, nine passenger, but I uh, just wanted to emphasize that Special Ed and Dr. Miller, uh, had, uh, she's indicated to us ideally they would like two vans for use at the senior high level and uh, it's for their, their crossroads program as well as other community-based programs. Um, and some of that has replaced the PAL, which we used to have students go to the BCIU. And the cost of the BCIU for having them run the program, PAL, for what we're doing here now, full time is 33,000, part time 16,000. So we've brought some efficiencies by having programs in house, but we need a van, another one, ideally, to support them the way that you want to support them or need to. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe, you know, once the new models are starting to be manufactured, we buy off state contract, I could bring back to the board a price, uh, you know, once we could get an estimate, contract price, maybe we can move ahead with one more for this year to help out the situation sooner than later. So if we, I'll bring it back to you as soon as we have the price. Mrs. Kutcher, do you have a question? No, I think I'll take the pass on it. Uh -huh. Any other questions from the board? Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Wright. You're welcome. If it's okay with the board, then uh, I'll move on with uh, getting specs together so that we can come back to the board for the bidding <coughs> process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we get to the Next section, we're doing a little follow-up on an item that came up a uh, couple of weeks ago uh, where there was a question about the legality of a tax refund to residents. Um, and uh, we have this evening our counsel from Sweet Stevens, Mr. Sean 
Bockinger and, and Mr. Lockyer, if you could maybe summarize uh, your opinion as a follow-up to that uh, uh, to that question. Sure, certainly will. Uh, uh, we looked into the process of a, uh, it, whether it was legally <coughs> permissible for the board to grant a tax refund to residents of the district in the middle uh, of the uh, fiscal year. And uh, at the end of the day, our conclusion is it is not permissible. Let me give you three uh, just basic reasons why we came to that conclusion. Uh, the first is that once that it's, you're only allowed to make one levy, one tax levy per year. And while a refund is not a levy per se, it actually affects the levy, the one levy that you make. So there's some interpretation out there. There's some court cases that would say that subsequent uh, action that changes the first levy is also a levy and therefore improper. Uh, the second thing we looked at is there are, there are forms of refunds or exemptions, uh, forms of tax relief that are available. Uh, refunds specifically in the middle of a uh, fiscal year are not listed in the school code as to one of those things that are uh, you know, tax relief. Probably most importantly, and what I would point to is the biggest thing of all, is that there is pretty solid case law out there that says that a school board can only act within the powers that are given to it that are enumerated in the school code. In this case, there is nothing in the school code that specifically says you are allowed to grant a tax refund in the middle of a fiscal year. And so therefore, it's our conclusion uh, that because that it's not an enumerated power, it is not a power that's granted by the school code, and therefore, technically speaking, legally speaking, the board cannot take that step. Any questions or anything? Yeah, I'd like to just address that issue, if I might. <clears throat> I read Mr. Lockinger's interpretation. I think it's well-reasoned, it's very supported, but I think we also know the legal precedents are routinely challenged in the courts. This is exactly what is happening in docket number 1619605, Exeter Township School District versus Exeter Township. This is the bus barn case that is being heard by Judge James Lillis in the Berks County Court of Common Pleas. In this case, the majority of the sitting Exeter School Board, in disagreeing with a standing legal precedent, voted to sue Exeter Township. So by its own example, the Exeter School Board has shown little regard for legal precedence in terms of dampening the will of the board majority. And while Mr. Lockinger's citations are well-reasoned, it still remains within the authority of the school board to pursue judicial relief in the issue of a tax refund should the board have the will to do so. Any other comments on the opinion? Yeah. Just, and I'm not sure this is related, but I think it sort of goes along, and that is we had a, we, we do business with, uh, is it Brandywine, the, the charter school, cyber, cyber charter school, and uh, they had related to us that they had approached the legislature about providing, for providing a refund to users of excess funds, and the legislature said they did not have the right to do that because it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the law. And, uh, and, and, as, and as far as uh, your analogy to this court case about the bus barn, uh, the court, this is really over an interpretation of use. The law is over an interpretation. Everything. No, it's interpretation. over an, but it's over an interpretation of use. No, it's over an, the lawsuit itself. The first, there's two lawsuits pending with against Exeter Township. One is over zoning. And the other is over whether or not the township actually has a decision to be able to make in this process. We're actually challenging the township's decision. Again, lawsuits, Mr. Lockinger makes his living challenging legal precedent. That's what lawyers do. That's what you do. You go to court and you fight because you want to change a precedent in, or, in your behalf. All I'm saying is that the school board is standing behind an opinion from an attorney that could be challenged if there was a will to challenge it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lofter, for that. 
Um, move on to our next item on the agenda. This is a discussion item. This is a follow-up to a, um, a, a request that came at our workshop meeting to review and, and possibly revise the timeline and procedure uh, for the selection of the assistant superintendent. And when we had our special meeting, which was um, on a Monday a couple weeks ago, uh, we reviewed um, or had conversations about how that process would unfold, um, and there was a, a vote taken and, and a decision made. Uh, since there's some um, continued you know, question about that, a debate about that, uh, we want to uh, open that up for uh, review and discussion and possible amendment to that, uh, to that process. Uh, so I will uh, actually turn it over to our personnel uh, folks, uh, Mr. Brady and uh, Dr. Bender, for any recommendations you might have. During our conversations, we were reviewing the suggested timeline, and in past practice, we've invited and encouraged the board to be present during the interview, during the second interview. The first interview has typically been a screening process that's occurred on a manage senior management level. Um, the second interview is typically when we take a poll, and typically it's committee of the whole, and that is why we're looking right now at round two, specifically at the state's board members, parentheses, personnel committee, slash board president, or designee, comma, principals. Um, we're looking at striking the word person, board members, and then personnel committee, getting rid of just the personnel committee, so it's, it's more encompassing of everyone that sits on this board to involve everyone in that process and not restrict it to only a few individuals to be present and involved. Steve, did you have anything else to add to that? If, are, you, are you making a motion? Was that the extent of the change, Mr. That, that was the, the change, that was the change that I was aware of. Was there anything else that you were aware of we were discussing at that time? Yes. I was looking at uh, the board policy 303 that refers to the employment of administrators. And in that, uh, so I support Mr. Brady's uh, recommendation for round two, but I'd like to extend the role of the board to round one where the, for the initial interviews that doesn't include any board members. And the basis for my recommendation is policy 303 that says as representatives of the board, the personnel committee may be actively involved with the superintendent designee and the administration in the recruitment and selection for all employees of this district. And it goes <coughs> on to say, members of the personnel committee are encouraged to attend the interviews conducted by the administration of candidates for such positions as teacher, administrator, instructional, and non-instructional supervisors. So my recommendation is to extend Mr. Brady's proposal to include representatives of the personnel committee in round one of the interview process. And that's based on our policy 303. Based on what David has suggested, I would like to propose an amendment to what we had previously discussed that in round one, we'll have the personnel committee involved in the interview process. And in round two, we would strike the words personnel committee and make it board members and all the others listed in that area. Second. Can, can I just have yeah. a motion and a second discussion? So just to, to be clear then, Dave, as the chair, as the president of the school board, would be involved in that as well. So we have representation from Mr. Brady, Dr. Bender, Dr. Hamburger in round one. Is that correct? Assuming yes. that's consistent with the timeline because things could theoretically change uh, if the timeline extends beyond um, the tenure. Uh, right, but if the, the yeah. timeline that was destroyed. Well, replaced. Yeah. Round one is proposed for the week of November 27. Right, which would mean you would be sitting at that point. Round two would be is December 11th, which is, means that the, the new board and the and, uh, uh, at that point, round two would be open to all sitting board at that time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what's being proposed. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. Just go right ahead. Have, what, what do you envision the, the board's role in this? Uh, 
because my, my concern is that all nine members show up and they're actively involved, involved in the interview process. I think you're overwhelmed with candidates. I think that would just be... Uh, it, it's, I, I believe it's at least... I know many of the interviews that I've attended as a board member, really I was more of an observer than I was an active participant in the interview. Mm -hmm. this, this board has had the entire board at interviews of a senior administrative level uh, prior to the, the final uh, vetting. I, I, so I, I don't me, remember that as the superintendent, yeah. but that's okay. Uh, to me, that actually uh, shows the candidate the involvement of the school board and their commitment to uh, getting the uh, top candidate here it, in the it, district. But it takes some orchestration. You just can't have nine extra people throwing out questions that aren't Oh, no. It, yeah, it was I, always organized. Yeah, Everyone okay. was assigned right. questions. There was typically a list of questions that <clears throat> came forward prior to the evening, and then the group that was going to participate in the interview would each identify a question they would ask, and it would consistently be the same question that would be asked to the interview. E. Right. Your, your, your amendment is not specific, and that's my concern about the amendment. I don't know. I've been on the same, been on the board at the same time as Mr. Diesinger. I remember interviewing every one of our high school principals. Uh, one of them under Nick Corvo, and the rest of them under Dr. Martin. Uh, I feel it's absolutely necessary that the board be able to conduct, participate in those interviews more than just one individual. There are many, the board is the authority to hire, the board is the authority to contract, and it's essential that the board know the uh, background of the individual, have the uh, ability to ask the individual that uh, we would ultimately select questions. They also have, uh, it is also prudent for them to know what alternatives are there. The board establishes policy, the board hires, the board fires, and the board appropriates money. And it's to do it without that background knowledge is to operate in the blind. So, I, that's why I endorse this uh, recommendation. Tony, so, I mean, just to clarify, you're saying that the board members would, would function as sort of an integral part of the interview process as equal uh, partners on each of these interview teams, round one and two. Is that correct? Is that the recommendation? That was not what I... The recommendation, as I understand it, was round one was personnel committee and Absolutely. you. Right. Round two was the sitting board on December 11th. Right. But I mean, right. the board members who are participating in those two rounds would function as uh, uh, my peers, let's say, mm -hmm. on the interview team. They're not there as observers. They're, they're there with the same level of input, the same level of involvement, and the same decision-making um, responsibilities as everybody else on that. Well, on the I'm, I'm relying on the uh, policy that says I may be actively involved. Well, can I just <laughs> and actively in policy. Can I just say that there is another policy and, and it's 302 and it speaks directly to the hiring of the assistant superintendent, not <clears throat> other administrators. And I, we're talking about the assistant superintendent, so I'm not sure whether that particular policy would actually be applicable. But I, am, I, I hear what you're saying for other positions as well. Um, I'd like to ask the solicitor, uh, we did pass something at a special board meeting. Now, now we're trying to pass something different. Is that is that possible to do this? Uh, yes, you can amend. <clears throat> you can either vote to rescind and then pass a new, uh, you know, a new procedure, or in this case, you can just uh, amend it and vote to amend the prior procedure. Yes. So then, I, I which think... policy are we working on? Um, the one that. Uh... You, you you said, Mr. Ben, Dr. Bender? 
Well, there are two policies. One has to do with you know, the hiring administrators. The other is the hiring of the, the superintendent and assistant superintendent. The hiring of, of the superintendent, assistant superintendent is, is policy 302, right. not 303. And you were talking about 303, Dr. Ray? Yes, and uh, under the guidelines, part three is policy 303. It says um, administrative position shall be deemed to be superintendent, assistant superintendent, and goes on to include others. So assistant superintendents included in this policy. And Dr. Phillips, you had given us a timeline. Is this kind of the same timeline as what we're talking about now? I don't believe it's a timeline. It's a makeup that I've heard. Sorry. No, but there are dates in your file. The dates were not changed. Is that correct? That was, that was your point. I haven't heard anything about dates at this point. Uh, we, we have a we have a copy of something here. She's just asking you whether it's what we just passed before. <clears throat> not, she asked about dates, I, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and I haven't heard any amendment to dates at this point. We're, we're not, we're no not change discussing okay. okay. There's not going to be any sure. changes in the dates. As, as planned by Dr. Phillips, we do not plan on altering that unless okay. we would find there is a extenuating circumstance yeah. that we would discuss at another time. I guess a question I have is just more theoretical, but you know there is a there's a board switch over during this period of time, and I do wonder about the transfer of knowledge and information as we go from a board. Uh, well, I guess two out of three of you guys will actually still be here. So, well, I think what I'm looking at is during that first interview, there would be more individuals outside of. Dr. Ember, Dr. Bender, and myself would be involved in that, and we would just be three parties that were listening to other input, whether it would be other principals, it's going to be other people who are with us, and we would just be able to express our opinion on the candidate we came for. But then, when our new board is with us in December and they're able to interview, they would be looking at a group that have been reduced and considered to be a little bit more the individuals we'd like to move forward with. So we wouldn't be restricting anyone that's going on the board from being a participant. Well, I'm not suggesting that you are. I mean, I think we had actually agreed back on October 2nd that, uh, in effect, we would follow that initial timeline, that the, this board would not rush to make a judgment, but that we would hand off the process to the incoming board. And I think the issue relative to the time frame outside of the amendment that you guys just made was that these guys, the, the candidates, many of whom are here tonight who may be sitting on December 5th, have asked for a role. And I, don't, I think originally, I don't think they were expecting a role to be interviewing the finalist one time. So you've changed that, which I think is... Well, they'll be able to interview twice now. Right, on the, the 11th right. and on the 21st. Right. I mean, I, and, I'll, and I'll say this, I mean, I, I appreciate your amendment and I support your amendment. Um, I uh, still believe that the selection is the superintendent's selection. I do believe there's a lot of value in having a collaborative process. Um, you know, the, the position is really a recognized agent of the state can only be certified by uh, a positive vote by the sitting board, and I think that you kind of achieve that positive vote by being involved in the process and having the confidence in the candidate that you've selected. I talked to Wilson, Schuylkill Valley in the last two days, um, both of whom invited their boards to be part of the process, uh, basically because they understand the importance of the involvement in that process to onboarding that person in that role who's critical to executing the mission of the school district. So, um, you know, I am supportive of that amendment that bridges both the responsibility of this board and also acknowledges the fact that the new board who comes in will also have a role. But I'd like, Carol? Um, I would like to add um, one other caveat to this, and I think it's important because the assistant superintendent has assumed a, curric a strong curriculum position in our school and we have this you now wonderful K-12 expansive idea of, of what curriculum is, is going to be about. So I would suggest that 
we add the uh, language arts coordinator and the math STEM program coordinator, both of which have a K-12 perspective of what we're trying to accomplish in our school. Those would be those would be additions to what has been proposed yes. in the motion. Yeah. And that would be for round one. I think they will just have insights by seeing these different people and they will have something to offer to the you know, I'm seeing the offer that might prove to be very valuable. I think you need a writing or you no, I think they would I think that tying into where Carol is suggesting, I think that would go along with saying department chairs and would, would fit into that area. I think that would be acceptable. I don't know if we'd have to amend anything to accomplish that. I just want to make... It's, they're not listed in the... Uh, no, they're not. Here, so, they're not. You know, the, the change would be, are you saying at the first level or second level? Well, we have an amendment level. on the floor, so she would have to amend the amendment. No, this is... Yes. The, if you want to include these folks by name, then you're going to have to admit. All right, that's my amendment. What is your to, amendment? To include the language arts coordinator and the math STEM program coordinator in round one of the um, uh, of the uh, interviews. Second. Thank you. Okay. President, a little, uh, it's a bit unusual since we do have the uh, candidates in the audience. Uh, could we invite comment from them since they will most likely be involved with this? Well, we're, we're just about approaching public comment, so I don't, I personally don't have a, 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 a any opposition to that. If uh, my thought is, we're about to vote on this, and since we have a uh, we have modified what might have been the normal procedures to uh, allow their participation. I think uh, if they'd like, when the new board is set, setting, they can modify this procedure. It would be better uh, to have it their concurrence at the moment. Well, let me, before we entertain public comment on that, let me give you my perspective on it. Because I, I have been thinking about this quite a bit, and I, I have a, a different outlook on it. Um, my concern is, is with a process that has the school board conducting the terminal interviews in the candidate vetting process. I, I don't believe it's consistent with the intent of the school code um, or, or our district policy where the primary responsibility of interviewing and, and recommending candidates should be in the hands of our professional staff and our superintendent. I've done some research on this issue and the sources that I find uh, indicate that nationally the recognized best practice is that board members should not participate in the interview process for hiring for positions other than that of a superintendent. Uh, the selection of the best candidates should be based upon a process of vetting by seasoned administrators and staff that are most familiar with the skills necessary for serving in this position. With all respect to our school board members who are well-intentioned, most of us are laymen and are not professionally trained educators with experience in pedagogy or educational practice. In Exeter, our assistant superintendent has a clearly defined skill set with specific responsibilities and must be knowledgeable and experienced with all aspects of the K-12 curriculum. Best practice teaching techniques, including differentiated instruction, must be able to provide or coordinate professional development for staff administration, and also must be an expert in student assessment and data analysis and data interpretation, and ultimately uh, familiar and intimate with the diverse aspects of the district's comprehensive plan. The school board overreach in the candidate selection process diminishes, I think, the, the role of and expertise of our professional staff. I don't mean to disrespect or, val or devalue the school board members and, and their importance in the hiring process. And the board already has several critical roles in the hiring process, as Mr. Quinter pointed out. The board sets the policies for the hiring. They approve the position. They set the salary and the benefits. They determine the terms of the contract. And, and the board also has final approval in regard to the hiring of any recommended candidate. So my only interest is, is really getting the most qualified individual for this position. And I think that could be best done by limiting the board's involvement and trusting the skills uh, and expertise of our professional staff who do this sort of thing routinely and do it so well. 
So I believe the process is previously uh, described, with the exception of Mrs. Kutcher's uh, amendments, uh, should, can, should remain unchanged. That's my position. Although we have uh, a, uh, a motion on the table. And we also, at this point right now, would entertain some comments from any of the incoming board members uh, relative to your opinion, if, if, if you'd like to. Excuse me, can I, if I can interject, because uh, Dr. Hamburger referred to policy 302, uh, employment of superintendent, assistant superintendent. So I brought that up, and one of the guidelines is, the scre a screening process shall be established that ensures the board has an opportunity to interview a sufficient number of finalist candidates so that an appropriate range of choices available for final selection. So I, I think I, well, there are two I'll sections. Agree. There are two sections to that, though. I think there's one related to the assistant superintendent, one to the superintendent. I just want to make sure that as you're describing that, that it's not relative to specifically the superintendent. I think it's reached. It's in. I don't think it it's breaks set. down either or. I think it's in the of both. Says superintendent or assistant superintendent. Because I, what I what I read is the board shall seek applicants for the position of assistant superintendent by recommendation of the superintendent. And that's directly from the here, too. So here's what I read. And it's under recruitment guidelines. This is what I'm reading. Yeah, it says assistant superintendent. By recommendation of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. That's under the authority. Well, I think it's, there's, a, there's a lot of May a lot of may and optional kind of language in there, and, and my, my opinion is based primarily upon a lot of the body of evidence out there that I'm seeing from educational ethics commissions and from uh, state education associations, uh, state uh, uh, school boards associations that, that strongly suggested um, this is essentially a, a, an overreach in form of micromanagement. So I would like to ask a question of uh, Dr. Phillips. Do you have a problem with the school board being involved in this process? Not at all. There was involvement from the beginning. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Hacker. Yes. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak as well. And um, it's very informative <coughs> hearing everyone's perspective. Um, I do agree with Mrs. Butcher about having uh, some staff members, personnel, um, involved in the, the process. No, I'm sorry, they need to hear on here for some reason. This isn't working. Okay. Um, because uh, as an educator, um, and hopefully going to be sitting on this board shortly, um, with, with all due respect, um, you had mentioned that we, we currently maybe don't have an educator with the uh, the knowledge about curriculum and pedagogy and um, so forth, um, which is one of the reasons why I think we needed a current educator sitting on this board. <coughs> so, um, I do know what I would be looking for an assistant superintendent for our students and our teachers, specifically because an assistant superintendent works so closely with staff, professional development, and the curriculum. Um, and I feel personally one of the, the pieces of the puzzle I would like to bring by sitting on this school board is that educator perspective of pedagogy and being in the trenches, knowing what's going on uh, firsthand, and um, becoming very, uh, having a very close relationship with the assistant superintendent. And I would personally, um, I mean, I can only speak as a candidate at this point and not on the board, um, but I feel very important, I feel it's very important, and I. I can't remember the document I had with me last time I spoke, but uh, the relationship between the board and assistant superintendent and superintendent is such a critical piece in getting along and working collaboratively for student success. And um, we want to value our superintendent and our assistant superintendent. We want to feel like they've, uh, there's a mutual respect. And therefore, I think there needs to be um, we, we all need to be a part of that process. Of inter not necessarily like the very beginning process, as we mentioned. I, I kind of agree with the timeline that's been set out so far. Um, but by second round, 
third round, I think that I liked the amendment that all the whole board should be involved. And I liked the idea that we all have our own specific question. We come out, you know, we discuss that prior to the to the meet and greet interview process with um, our, the last few candidates, but not just down to the last candidate. There is no way that I would um, approve a contract on someone I've never met or talked to. Questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, I do have one more thing. Sorry, sorry, Andrew. Um, and Dr. Hamburger, you had mentioned that how do we know he or she is qualified? Um, like, how, what's our expertise in knowing they're qualified? Well, if we're sitting on this board and we know what our curriculum is, we know what the standards are, we know how to, we know what level of success um, we want our students to, you know, graduate, so forth. Uh, we should be qualified board members to be able to be part in hiring a, a superintendent or assistant superintendent. And um, if that is, uh, I look at a school board as somebody being very intelligent in the business aspect and the finance aspect and the, you know, every p person plays a role. Um, and we sh again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself now, but the role I, I feel like I would bring to the board and I would play in this process would be, I think I would know if they're qualified. How do they feel about certain things um, throughout PA, like Common Core and special education and cyber school and, and all those things. But again, specifically, an assistant superintendent works so closely with the staff and the curriculum and professional development. And I think that's, that, that we need an educator, we need our board to be supportive of who we choose for our staff at Exeter, our teachers and our educators and our paraprofessionals to feel confident with the choice we've made. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Harry. And I would contend to you, you were probably one of the exceptions to the majority of, of school board members throughout the state, you know, who does have a background and worked actively in education, so you, you do bring, obviously, your skill set, you know, to the, to the table. Thank you. Um, but I'd just like to say, uh, it is the superintendent's choice. We might have input, but the superintendent is the one who picks who his assistant will be, or her assistant, uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's a female superintendent, they pick who the, the, who the uh, assistant will be. But the superintendent, but the superintendent cannot let a contract. Right, or the approved. The superintendent cannot let a contract. Well, the I would, board has the final say. I understand that, but I would hope that if uh, yes, we need to support uh, our professional staff and have some confidence in them, so I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I would hope that if uh, the, the superintendent picks an, an assistant, that the board would support that position because I know when Dr. Davies was uh, was was being interviewed and, and a number of other candidates, we listened to them all. We had input, but I remember that Dr. Martin picked the superintendent, uh, the assistant superintendent, her assistant, and I would hope that's what we would do. I would beg to differ. That is not the practice that Carrie was carrying all that time. We, we used our normal procedure of putting the thing up on the board and getting the numbers. That's true. That was, and we but accepted the recommendation, but the board picked the assistant superintendent. Just as we picked the superintendent, and I think that Dr. Bender would concur that that has been the practice over the decades that he has been present. Well, there we are. We're managing again. Mr. Aaron. Uh, I just wanted to agree with um, Part of Dr. Hamburger's uh, sentiment about excluding board members from the first round of interviews. I think that's more of a test of capability than it is uh, what direction that the board wants to see the assistant superintendent take uh, in conjunction with the superintendent. Um, bringing along what you had said, we are exceptions um, with with exceptions. Uh, we are lame, um, and we have. In my opinion, probably not the best capability of assessing whether somebody is capable to complete the job that they are required to. And I think that that would be a better thing for the administrators to be included on. Um, for the second round, though, I think that that would be more appropriate for smaller portions of the board to participate in. Because I think that there was um, reasoning behind not including the entire board 
in an early selection process due to certain requirements that you have with the Sunshine Act um, and how that you were unable to make, well, you're not unable, but certain of your commitments may turn into uh, legal requirements, and I think that that just might be more appropriate to leave to the entire board making the selection at the third stage and smaller groups of the board being involved in the second stage. I think also aside from that, that there's a question of what the current board's involvement is versus the next board involvement. Um, what we talked about beforehand, and at least the candidates are speaking of, what we had mentioned beforehand is that we believe that it was appropriate for the next board to take this uh, decision under their own way rather than leave it up to the current board. And while it's not entirely different from what you're suggesting, if the policy committee of the current board is making a decision about which candidates are going to move forward to the second round, then the current board is using their authority to influence what the next board will have the decision to make through. And I think that it would be more appropriate for the board to leave themselves out of that decision and not influence what the administrators and other staff members are going to decide during that first round of interviews. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you for Mr. For President. Comments. I would uh, submit that we are the sitting board. The first round is a matter of getting rid of the chaff. And for the personnel committee to be involved is entirely appropriate. And for the, I have already mentioned the reason that the entire board should be involved in interview of more than one. So, and the entire board has the right of contracting and the right of uh, appropriation. Hello. Hi, I'm Michelle Stratton, and I also just wanted to iterate my opinion, which is very similar to Jasmine's. Um, I'm new to this process, um, but it, it seems to be that as a board, we get to vote yes or no to the candidate. I don't know how I, hopefully being on the board in a few months, can vote on someone that I don't personally know. I don't know how I could make a judgment on that. I don't know how I could feel that that person is a good person that I could work with that the superintendent could work with, that our teachers could work with, and the only way that I could know that I could vote yes in confidence would be to meet that person. Um, seeing what someone looks like on a piece of paper and their credentials doesn't tell me a lot about that person. Um, it doesn't tell me if they work well with others. It doesn't tell me if they're nice, if they're friendly. Um, I would much rather meet that person and make a judgment on them, meeting them, than seeing them on a piece of paper. And that's not to say that I don't uh, trust the superintendent's judgment because I absolutely would because they're choosing several candidates. So they already have their say. They come to us with two or three. Um, they've already picked the two or three top people. So then I'm just saying, okay, I've met those people, and yes, I agree that I like that person. And I can't agree if I haven't met that person. Could I just clarify that the initial proposal that was in place did give an opportunity for the full board to interview the final uh, candidate that was recommended for the for the position, four, four candidates, this is final candidate, but four candidates for the position. So finalists would have a chance to, to interview with the board. So the, the intent was to make sure, to not necessarily participate in the interview process, to make sure the person you're voting on, you'll get a chance to know, you know, you know thoroughly mm -hmm. before, you make, before you have that final vote. Yes, uh, my concern is, I don't think it's fair to meet one person. So if it comes down at the end and I'm meeting one person, how can I compare or judge them to someone else? So in the end, whether I'm meeting someone in round two or I'm meeting them in round three or if I'm meeting them in round 100, I need to meet more than one person to make an accurate judgment on what kind of person I think that they are and how I think that they would work with this district, with our teachers, and essentially with my child that goes to this school. You, you can't vote on someone that you don't know. And I feel that way about this, the superintendent, the sister, assistant superintendent, and also principals. Has anyone here met the um, proposed principal for Watton Creek by any chance? Other than the superintendent? That gentleman person? might be here tonight. I'm sorry, what? That gentleman may be here this evening. He may be, but has anyone met him other than the superintendent is my question. No, gone through three rounds of interviews. No, I, I don't think board members have no, had no. any. There have been other people that have met him, just not us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from I do. I just would like to just jump in again and say that I, I do think that as a board member, the majority of us haven't gotten onto the board to be here to approve class trips. 
that we've gotten on the board to be involved in both the uh, uh, strategic direction um, of the district and policy. That's what a board does. One of the most important people in carrying out the strategic direction and policy is the assistant superintendent. And because of that and because of the interplay between the board, I think it's critical that um, we have the ability to be as involved in this process as we can be. Any other comments? Well, it, just a comment, a real brief comment. But I, I, would, I, I would like to second what, and, and thank you for the work that you did. I spent a year as a member of the Pennsylvania School Boards Association and spent a year earning a fellowship in school governance. And best practice is exactly what Dr. Hamburger said. And, and, and again, I've said it probably for the last three meetings. I think we need to really be careful and reconsider about overstepping our bounds and like we're managing. And I see it every day with this board. And it's, it's become a great disappointment to me. Okay. Are there any other comments? I'd like to move this forward for a, a vote. Can you remind uh, us we, what we're voting for? Yes, can we? We're going to move the uh, yeah, yeah, so we, can, we, can, can someone reiterate the, um, the motion uh, since we've had so much discussion? Uh, this is Guy's design. This is Guy's design. This is Guy's design. Yes, what we're doing. I can find it. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> two pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, in the middle. Oh. <laughs> the no, sir. Her amendment. No, what we have to vote on first, what's technically on the table now, is the amendment that was the made. amendment. The amendment to the amendment. Correct. The yeah. amendment that is going to be put on. Yeah. That's what's being. Voted on. Mrs. Kutcher uh, recommended, seconded by Mr. Brady, that the language arts coordinator and STEM coordinator be added to the interview group in uh, round one of the in round one. Okay, we have a we have a motion and a second for that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Opposed. Motion carries. Now that's amended to the original amendment that was made. Uh, so the original amendment now includes that language, and that's what the vote would be on that. And so can we have a reiteration of that? original amendment, or the original amendment, which from my understanding was that uh, round one would in include the uh, personnel committee and board president or designee, and round two would include all board members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. correct. Okay. And as amended with Mrs. Kutcher's? Yes, with Mrs. Kutcher's amendment. So, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Excuse me, is the superintendent involved in this? In this? Oh, yes. Of course. Okay. I didn't hear you say that. Do you want to be involved, Bob? Yeah. Is right there the line? Line? He would be the person at right before the period okay. and prior to the next sentence said question slash answer plus presentation and or writing sample. That would be the superintendent before the period in that's, in that sentence inside the directions that are given in the document that's provided in tonight's agenda. Okay, are we all clear? Okay, all, all in favor, say aye. Aye. As opposed? No. Motion carries. Okay, we're going to move on to public comments. So if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to come up, this is the time to speak to anything relative to what's on the agenda, as well as anything that may be applicable for our board to do. And then please introduce yourself. And, uh, uh, Jasmine Hacker. Um, I just wanted to say something, Mr. Biesinger, about micromanaging, and I completely agree with you. I think that a school board um, should not micromanage, specifically in each school, um, however, I think your superintendent and your assistant superintendent and your administrators are really the basis, the, the foundation of letting them then go do their thing. So to me, micromanaging would be in the schools and checking out the teachers and the aides and, and so forth. I think that our, it is the board's job to hire the most effective, most um, qualified, superintendent, assistant superintendent, as well as administrators, because ultimately 
those are the people that we're going to trust them to further and spread, you know, spread out the knowledge and the, the qualifications and the effective, uh, I can't think of the word I want to say, but I picture like a tree and we are the roots and then we build up from there. But our, our roots need to be trustworthy and solid in who we choose. So I agree with you. I don't want to micromanage at all. I want to trust my principals in each district, or sorry, in each school. Um, I want to trust, uh, clearly trust my superintendent more than anything, as well as the assistant superintendent. And I want our teachers to feel that trust as well, because our board did their job in choosing the best qualified candidates. So I appreciate what you said, but I just, I don't know, got a little like hot under the collar there, where I wanted to say, no, I don't want to micromanage, but I think those, those key roles are are, are such a foundation for us to be a part of. There's a, there's a ton of literature you could spend some time with. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, folks. Jerry Yellow, uh, 106 Michelle Drive. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the proposal to hire on KCBA as a superintendent of, of buildings. Uh, their cost structure, or the fee structure, rather, is, is, is pretty high. And uh, at 12%, and, and it, most of the things are going to fall into the 12% area, and even in the one to 250,000, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And I would like to see a little more work done to find somebody who one or two percent on $15 million of building there's going to be a lot of money. Money that can be put to better use than lining somebody's pocket. So I'd like to ask you to table that until some more viable uh, uh, firms can be assessed. You shook your head, why? I think if you were to look at professional services, they're typically put into a graduated scale. Mm -hmm. Where you, when you have a less contract, you're going to see a greater percentage of fee that's brought upon you, and when you bring the sum up to a larger number, it proportionally will reduce mm -hmm. because it takes into account is of scale. I think when you're looking at 12 percent on a $200,000 contract, though it does look like a substantial amount of money, when you start looking at hourly rates for individuals and then put the typical overhead structure that goes on that, you're looking at trying to recoup your costs for what's anticipated to be involved because it's the individual that we're looking at bringing on to the project would be writing our scope and then providing the inspection services and verification that, that contracts are followed through according to what's bid upon. So in this case, I think looking at from a professional point of view, I think that the structure is correct as long as they are providing what we anticipate they're going to be involved in. And our goal would be to be able to package things in such a way that we're not looking at the $100,000, $200,000 jobs, but coming in, for example, maybe we're looking at like a $2 million project, so we can then bring that fee down to get our lower percentage and get the most bang for our buck at the same time. Okay, but, but aren't there, the, the, in the, the economy that we have... The economy we have right now for engineers has recovered in the last six to seven years. I think right now we're actually working at a very tight location, at least with engineering. I can tell you that everyone I know is an engineer, if they're qualified, they're working without a problem, and typically our backlog is one to three years. Okay, but uh, still, in the economy that we have, with the experience that you're speaking of, and with the amount of competition, there's got to be somebody out there at 10%, as opposed to the 12 and that 2% is a huge amount of money. I think that we would have to have parties that you're aware of that would come to us and then explain to us their services that we would interview, similar to what we did to KCBA, to be able to identify them as the party we were working with. Or perhaps the board or whomever it would be could go out and do that, uh, do that work and find somebody. Because I think we're talking about the taxpayers. We did this already. I'm sorry? We already did this when we brought KCPA in. No, I don't think we did it per project. We brought them in to assess our facilities. And while they are capable and competent, I think what Mr. Gelliff is saying is that we should just follow a bid process. 
I think that's what he's saying. I don't think you don't bid professional services. Typically. You don't have to bid professional it's not, services. It's typically not a practice. I know it's typically not a practice, but if the school district wants to say that it is looking to save every penny that it can, then maybe it's something to consider. I think that's what Mr. Gellif is saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because, I mean, when you, when you talk, I mean, when I'm out doing campaigns, because I'm running for the board, I, I spoke to one person, my neighbor Chuck, who was 72 years old and retired when he was 58 from car tech. Now, Chuck is looking at having to go back to work to pay taxes. And it's, you know, I don't care what anybody says, that's criminal. This guy having to go back to work after 14 years to pay taxes. And we got to give these people, ourselves included, some relief. And if we can save $700,000, $500,000 on fees for, for uh, KCBA, I mean, it goes a long way to, to holding the line on taxes for these people. We got senior citizens who are moving out because they just cannot afford us anymore. And every penny does need to be conserved. So one more thing I'd like, if I may, uh, the the roof on Jackson Mall Elementary, which I know this was discussed one month ago or maybe even two months ago, and I should have stood up then, but the, the meeting was going real long. So it was uh, brought in by WTI, Tremco, supposed to cost $284,000. And in their cover letter, they say that they're going to hire Warco Roofing <coughs> to do the actual work. Well, by that, uh, in, the, in that letter, it says to me that WTI is working as a general contractor. Why do you need a general contractor for a single-stage project? Anybody would understand if you're putting up a school building, you need somebody to dig a foundation, you need somebody to build the building, you need a roof, et cetera, et cetera. You need a general contractor to pull all those threads together and get things done on time. But in a single stage project, you've got a company working as a general contractor. How much are they charging us? How much money are we wasting when we've got Rob Perzui here who could go out and get those bids and find the best way to do it? And it wouldn't cost us a thing. So how much of that 284 is going to WTI? And why, can you explain why we are using it at this point? The district has had a uh, roof um, replacement program for a number of years through uh, Trempo. Uh, they do, it's part of a, a joint purchasing program. They uh, write the specifications, they select the best roofers, uh, and what we have found very um, economical uh, is that they really do promote a restoration, not necessarily a complete tear off uh, and replacement. They have a technology that we're using and using at Jacksonville where it's restoring, so and giving us 30 years. Uh, so on a cost uh, per square foot, doing a restoration is much more economical in getting 30 years than doing a complete tear off where you could get, what, 20 years on that, or maybe 30. But, you know, we checked out the prices on cost per square foot on doing this. We are getting a bigger bang for our buck and getting 30 years out of it. And we have used them uh, for, and this was started with the previous facility director, um, and having an ongoing uh, restoration on a lot of our roofs. Now some of them we have replaced, but uh, because of this, uh, which we believe is a good technology, uh, we have saved a lot of money you know, over the years. So are we saying that, that Mr. Fuzui is not capable of doing that same job for nothing? I think what we're saying is that we have had an arrangement with the roofing company Trenco to monitor the roofs on all of our buildings. They come to us with recommendation, or they come to Rob with recommendations, and it's a coordinated effort using their expertise and using Rob's expertise for other things that he's responsible for. It's not a new relationship. It's been going on for years and has proven to be economical over those years. So as far as Warco doing it, we don't really care because they're working under the uh, 
They're working under the, the state contract. I'm not concerned about work on work. I'm, I'm concerned no, you're about concerned about it being subcontracted and how much Trinco is making on it. The fact is, it's being done under a state contract, so there is no difference in pricing, no matter whether we deal directly with Warco or whether we go through Trimco. Okay, so then that 284000 all of it is going to Warco. I am not going to sit here and argue the specifics. I'm just telling you the truth. If you can't accept them, I'm sorry. All right? All right. I'll remember. Any other comments from the public to see? Okay, well, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next section of the agenda, item five, the minutes. Um, I move that we approve the board workshop minutes from September 12th, and item B, the board voting minutes from <coughs> September 19th. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Treasurer support. <coughs> Mrs. Page. I move, the, I move the treasurer's report for the period ending 9-30-2017. Following financial statements are attached. The YTG summary of revenue and expenditures, all funds, <coughs> statements of assets, liabilities, and fund balances, payroll and fringe benefits summary, investment statements, student activity, and athletic funds. I didn't hear a second. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The next section is board policy. Um, we have six policies for second reading. This is where we make final approvals for these policies. Um, we have one policy for alternative instruction another for adult education, class size, <coughs> assess assessment system, homework, and religious holiday cultural activity observance. I'd like to break these up in, in two sections because the following after that have our first reading. So I, I'd like to make a motion for, um, to approve the, uh, those first six uh, policies for second reading. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The next six policies um, are first read policies. Uh, we've had an opportunity to have some discussion at our recent workshop meeting. Some amendments were made to some of these um, policies, some minor uh, changes to language, uh, which we've had opportunity to discuss. Um, those would be the home education program, the uh, extracurricular participation by home education students, English as a second language, um, charter schools, extracurricular participation by charter, cyber charter schools, <coughs> students, and migrant, migrant students. So I, I move that we uh, uh, approve these uh, six policies for first reading. Okay. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Business functions, Dr. Heron. Item 8A. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the submission of Plan Time Part K to the Pennsylvania Department of Education for the partial current refunding of the General Obligation Bond Series 2011 to the issuance of General Obligation Bond Series 2017. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8B. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors exonerates Ex Exeter Township School District tax collector from the collection of the remaining 2016 aye. per capita tax duplicate for Exeter Township consisting of 1,495 delinquent per capita and 674 exonerated per capita bills, and authorize the district to submit the delinquent per capita bills to Berkheimer Associates for collection. Prior year consisted of 
1,474 delinquent per capita and 613 exonerated per capita bills. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 8C. Resolved, the Board of School Directors of the Exeter Township School District authorizes settlement of the assessment appeal filed by Carbo Group Limited, number 15-20243, Berks County Court of Common Pleas, in accordance with the attached stipulation and resolve <coughs> further that Leah Rottenberg Esquire is authorized to execute the stipulation on behalf of the school district. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, Mr. President, I abstain from that vote. Thank you. Item 8D, resolved. The Board of School Directors of Exeter Township School District authorizes settlement of the assessment appeal filed by Exeter Township School District number 16-20158, Berks County Court of Common Pleas in accordance with the attached stipulation and resolved further that Leah Rottenberg Esquire is authorized to execute the stipulation on behalf of the school district. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 8E. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors award the Exeter Township School District varsity softball dugout project base bids for general construction and electrical to the following lowest responsible bidders. Base bid general construction, Bolton Construction Inc. Base bid electrical, yeah. A.N. Lynch Co. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? I have a question. Can uh, somebody give us a, first, uh, a square foot price on these okay. I can't give you a square foot, uh, but I can tell you that I've looked into uh, Wilson is building dugouts on their soft field, softball field on the basis of the article. Uh, Title Nine. <laughs> Title Nine. Yeah, okay. Uh, some claim, complaints there. Theirs is on flat land. They're also not getting the additional fencing that we're getting to complete the uh, project here. Ours. We have to dig out into the bank, which more that, and then on the other side, they have to extend the foundation down because we're on the down slope of the hill. So the architect took a look at these uh, at this bid and analyzed it based upon his experience, and he felt that we were getting the best we were going to get. So uh, we're still under Title Nine. Uh, I really don't want to see the athletic department or this uh, school district get involved in the water. I, I know, Bob. It just seems so extravagant. I know. Dugouts. I know. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, look, I'm looking uh, for bathrooms and showers <laughs> and stuff. Like Russ, just, just, to, just to clarify, I know that it's listed here as dugouts, and you know, Mr. Prezui um, could, could correct me if I'm wrong. I believe at the last meeting he thought the, the, the pricing was fair, but but what we're also doing is we're we're surrounding the entire in, included in this proposal, I believe, is the entire uh, fencing down the uh, first and third base lines, as well as the fencing associated with the um, the bullpens. So that basically, where we are enclosing the field, which is a player safety issue and a fan safety issue, it 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 it, 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 it minimizes the possibility of somebody coming onto the field. And it minimizes the possibility of somebody who's chasing a foul ball running into the crowd. So there's so there's more than just dugouts. I hear you. How big do you think a dugout is? If we're, gonna, if we're going to renovate the junior high, we could get it cheaper. Then 158 days. Yeah, you probably could. Because yeah. uh, that's how we got it at the base, at the exactly. uh, senior high. No, I, I just I'm sorry. I, maybe it's becoming an age issue. Now everything I see just seems outrageously expensive. <laughs> I can't even go to the grocery store anymore. It just drives me nuts. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to, I'd just like to, to say that, that I'm going to be voting against this uh, um, this, this uh, pro um, proposal. Um, while I, I do agree, obviously, that we need to provide dugouts, I'm opposed to the plan. 
um, that we used, the specific plan that we used, and the exorbitant costs that are included here. I mean, I know we referenced the Title IX in an effort to provide equal access to programs and comparable facilities and resources, but I fail to see where Title IX requires us to provide identical facilities, and that's kind of what we've done here. We've sort of taken the exact plan that we used for the you know, the boys soft, uh, baseball field and, and superimpose that onto the softball field. So I believe in this case that there's essentially been a misinterpretation of the legal requirements to suggest that anything short of the same structure would be unfair or discriminatory, which I don't think it would be. Um, as a board, I think we also look for ways to control and curb costs. And this proposal does not really, in my way of looking at it, adhere to that principle. So for those reasons, I, um, I'll vote no, but I am receptive to an alternative proposal uh, with uh, substantially reduced costs. Well, I think that the board should remember that it has made some earlier decisions uh, related to the athletic field uh, being equal to boys. And, and while I understand you're looking at it through the lens of a legal perspective, I'm also looking at it through the lens of a moral perspective, and I think that girls are equal to boys, and I will support this. I agree with that as well. But I, I, I think if you look around the county, I would say that there are a few softball fields, and maybe Wilson is an exception, that really have this elaborate uh, type of structure that would be used, what, 10 times a year for our softball players to, to really play their game. And I, I, think it's, I think it's excessive. I think it's exorbitant. And the, the, the amount of money stuns me, and I think about what really that money could be used for if it were applied to educational um, services and programs. Any other discussion? Okay, we have a motion on this. Oh, May I oh, ask, sorry. are there other options for dugouts other than the ones that are being suggested? Are I'm not familiar with any other alternatives that were provided. Uh, yes, there, there are uh, other alternatives. There's uh, um, the dugouts were modeled as was discussed after the boys varsity dugouts, which have a storage facility, which have electric, um, no running water, no showers, no AC. Um, so you know those dugouts could be scaled back. Um, again, you're probably not looking at that much of a cost difference. There are uh, temporary or uh, modular dugouts um, that I personally don't uh, find appealing, but they are an option. Uh, I did look into that when this was first being discussed. Uh, never got an official quote from some of the vendors, which is pricing out through the web and stuff like that. We were looking at probably around $60,000 just for the modular dugouts. Again, we do have the site work issue, you know, digging into one hill and building up another to support those structures. So, uh, you know, that the, the dugouts we're getting aren't the only option, but, you know, that's that's what I was directed to pursue, and that's what I pursued. And how many quotes did we get, or bids did we get on that? We got two bids on the construction, one bid on the electrical. Do you feel if we had more time to research it and look into it, we might find a better price? Um, it's possible. I can't say for sure. Um, it was a pretty tight uh, timeline to get those dugouts constructed basically this fall before the winter so they would be available for spring. Um, if it was a summer project, it might be less, it might be more. I can't, I can't so say. That's there's, my concern that there is a rush to it. There's, uh, and if the girls have used the facilities that they had for a while now, that if we didn't put a rush to it, that we might be. It's possible, but I can't say for sure. Right. How, how specific? You. How specific were the RFPs that were put out for the? Were the RFP put out for the bid? Uh, or did we just? Did it just say we went through dugouts? No, they were very specific. They were drawings. There were specifications. The whole nine yards. Okay. So. And, and this is what we found. Thank you. Any further questions? If I can make one last comment, I'm sorry. Sure. I, I agree with Mike. Um, we went into this wanting to have a fair facility for the girls so that it was compatible to the boys' facility. 
Um, we were, if I, if I remember correctly, given some price it, pricing ideas of what it might cost to get to that point. I don't remember seeing anything like this, so I think that's where I'm feeling a little confused about it. I mean, I understand that's not yeah. something you can guess on at that point. No, but you're right, because I did pull the athletic committee meeting minutes from when we spoke, and you know, much, much like anything, somebody throws out a figure and we lock into that figure without really doing any research on it. And the minutes, can, the minutes contain a number of fifty thousand dollars. So I think that's why, you know, we we you know, in retrospect, should I have included that in the minutes? Yes, because it was discussed in the minutes, but it should have been listed as um, an un, an unbid project. I do appreciate Mr. Prezui's effort here. Um, in the work that he has done to get us to this point. But you're right, I think the minutes drove our mindset around this, but that's what was discussed in the meetings, and we always strive to try to be as accurate as we can with the minutes. Any further discussion? Is there anything we can do to reduce the costs? I mean, is this a lump sum cost, or is it a itemized bid that we receive in any way, shape, or form? In my discussions, um, which I would not advocate for, but um, you could remove the fencing, um, which would again potentially create some safety issues for our athletes and also for the people attending the games. But I believe that Wilson School District gave some consideration to that. I don't know if they moved forward with the fences at all. Do you know, Rob? Uh, I'm not sure about Wilson, but I did speak with uh, the architects that did the specifications and asked them uh, about revisions that could be done to save money and uh, aside from you know changing the quality of the block structure and, and some you know quality of fencing you're not talking about moving the needle that much maybe docking five thousand dollars off that uh, that price what, what is the what's the cost of well, if you break the fencing out what's the cost I don't know what the oh, all right. that's, I, I think that's another issue is that this thing was all lumped together on this. I mean, we're looking at a four-foot high fence. I mean, that's not providing a lot of protection. I mean, it's... Did you ever run into a four-foot fence, Jim? I'd rather not run into a fence. I'd rather not run into a fence that's either, what but what I'm saying Spe is that the, the fence the, keeps people from easily coming onto the field, and it keeps you from falling into the crowd. I mean, that's, that's basically what it does. I mean, I'm not... You know, if, I prefer that we have safety for our students, but if we're moving the fence reduces the price enough that the board is willing to support it, then oh, remove the fence. Oh, no, I was just interested no, in I, what it contributed I, to the overall cost. That's, I, well, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that has been pointed out a number of times is the fact that the site constrains us and the fact that we're getting additional cost because of that. Was there any consideration in adjusting the location of the field? I and mean, when I look at that field, it's kind of not all the way into the field. It looks like it's kind of set on the corner. Could we have pushed that field up 30 or 40 feet and possibly reduce some of the impacts that were occurring here? Probably it great. I think there's another athletic field, I don't remember what it is, on the other side that's used uh, for other uh, purposes, Jim. All for the question. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 As opposed? No. 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 Can I show of hands, please, for the, those not in favor? That's it for us. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no, no. 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 Put the other hand up. Yeah. Okay. So, motion, motion carries? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Item. Okay. Item 8F. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors authorize district administration to accept a fee proposal from KCBA to provide architectural engineering services, which represents an on-call professional services agreement for various work orders for maintenance <coughs> projects identified in the five-year maintenance program. The fee is a sliding scale percentage percent of construction costs based upon the identified scope of each work order <coughs> the construction value range greater than Two hundred fifty thousand. A fixed fee will be determined for projects with a value range of two hundred fifty thousand or less. So 
So, a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'm just going to say I'm not going to support this, but I do want to thank the effort of Mrs. Guidish for getting me the information I asked for at the last board meeting. So, it's talking about a fixed fee, but the fixed fee has not been established yet, is that correct? It's talking about the sliding scale and uh, in order <coughs> looking at the projects that are on the horizon for 1718 this year and 1819, and in the interest of getting specifications. Uh, together and getting the bid out on the street and getting it awarded so that we can get this work done you know, as soon as the students leave the buildings and get it done during the summer we've identified the HVAC, the geothermal well field, the HVAC major system replacements, Jackson Alder Rain, field regrading at Riften, secure vet vestibules, uh, there's generator in there and some envelope or masonry repointing. And KCBA, we, what we would do is actually bundle all of that together and it would, uh, the front end, you know, specifications, uh, it would be one document and we would be going out and then the back end, the actual detail, the general contractor, HVAC, electrical. Uh, so. If we did all those together, and this is what they're suggesting, it would be over two million. And that sliding scale of two million is eight percent, or one hundred seventy thousand. Um, so that's really what they're indicating. Okay. They bundle them, even though they're kind of different. You could still bid it all together and have the document reflect everything that you need. Uh, and then, as far as LED and security cameras, you can better define them and come up with a fixed fee versus a percentage. And we also have the option of looking at state contract and uh, for both purchase and installment. So we're still evaluating those. But um, that's a nutshell. Any additional discussion? Have we used a break? This is Guyers. Have we inquired with AEM or any other architectural firms locally regarding their fee structure? I did not uh, inquire uh, with them. I did some general research on uh, fee structures of architects, engineers, and the ranges, 6 to 12 percent. I actually looked back at EI Associates when we use them for the elementary and the minimum with them was uh, anything over five million was at six percent and below five million and you know a little bit more so i it, what they proposed seemed reasonable uh, based on that and really just trying to move ahead uh, kcba is very familiar uh, so they pretty much have done some of the uh, legwork, in a sense, and know they can hit the ground running, writing the specifications, we're having to almost go back, you know, a couple months explaining to another architect, well, this is really what we want to do. So it's just really in the interest of trying to move these ahead, these projects ahead, which is the direction that I believe we got from the board. You know, Rob, do you want to add anything? Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. <laughs> Item 8G. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors approve the donation of a Baldwin acrosonic piano to the school district from Mrs. Joanne Pope. The piano is in very good condition and is valued at $2,050. Thank you. Uh, second. With a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd like to ask Dr. Phillips if that's for his office. It's going to be on the, the veranda. Tickling the eyebrows? I'd just well, like to comment, I think it's very generous. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's just good. Yeah, absolutely. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, personnel committee, Dr. Bender. Part A, I move that the Board of School Directors approve the following resignations of administrative staff. Certificated staff, support staff, certificated substitutes, 
support substitutes, and extracurricular staff. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I would like to make a comment. This is Kutcher. I would like to thank Dr. Davies for all the work you've done with curriculum and for the STEM and the math program. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I can also <laughs> wish you well in your new position. Thanks. Um, thank you for the opportunities you gave me, and uh, we have some great teachers to work with, very dedicated and administrators, and I've learned so much being here, and uh, I'll miss you guys. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> We have a motion and a second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I move that the Board of School Directors approve the following retirements listed under Part B as stated on the agenda. Administrative staff, certificate staff, and support staff. Seven. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, have we, have we established the start date yet for uh, the Owatin principal, or is that something you're still negotiating? We're waiting on the, I'm sorry, we're waiting on the formal approval, and then we'll negotiate that. Mrs. Kutcher, did you have a comment? Uh, actually, I'd like to thank Susan Cook for her years here. I, she, um, it's been a pleasure. She was. She was wonderful with the um, Exeter Community Education Foundation. Just really, really helped out. I trust her retirement will be exciting. Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Under appointments, I move that the Board of School Directors approve the appointment of Jeffrey T. Fries as a Watton Creek principal. Replacing Susan Cook in an annual salary of $120,000, effective upon release from his current district. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? I would like to make a comment, please. Mrs. Kutcher. With all due respect to Mr. Fries, whom I have never met, I will be voting no on this motion. My concern is not with Mr. Fries per se, but I have serious concerns regarding some unresolved procedural issues. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Mr. Quinter. Again, with uh, no, re no uh, in Mr. Freeze, I read your, uh, I read your uh, resume. You look like you are a fine, qualified individual. However, I will be voting no on this because I know nothing other than the resume about Mr. Freeze. Uh, I have not been able to talk to him about his philosophy of dealing with the public. I have not been able to talk with him about his philosophy of dealing with uh, our staff at Owatin. I don't know how he feels about our curriculum. There's many things I don't know, and, uh, and I can uh, not vote in favor without the information. Thank you. Any further discussion? I would just like to... Um, Welcome, Mr. Fries. I have a bit of a conflict of interest in that my wife does teach at Owatin, so I won't talk more about that. But what I will say is that at the start of this process, I know I specifically asked for uh, a process and a timeline um, that was quickly provided and followed, and I appreciate that we went through that process. I thought it was thorough. Any additional discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Fries, would you like to say something? Certainly. Uh, just again, I'm looking forward to being able to get to know you guys better uh, and to be able to develop those relationships with you and the community and humble to have this opportunity. So again, thank you. I appreciate it very much. I look forward to my time here at Exit. So how much? Time? How much?
How much influence do you have with your, uh, your former employer? Are you going to be able to come like tomorrow or what? Do you want to come and negotiate with me? <laughs> <laughs> I'd take Russ with me. <laughs> I'll continue with Part C, the appointments, and move that the Board of School Directors approve or ratify the appointments of certificated staff, support staff, certificated substitutes, support substitutes, and extracurricular staff. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Our last item under appointments is I move that the Board of School Directors approve the guest teachers listed on the agenda. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. <laughs> I move that the Board of School Directors approve or ratify the following leaves of absence listed in Part D for certificated staff and support staff. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I move that the Board of School Directors approve or ratify the following request for a change of status as listed in Part E. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. I move that the Board of School Directors approve or ratify the attached list of course requests attached to Part F of the agenda. Second. This is an action not a report. Okay. For the course requests, so that's incorrect. That we need to the agenda. So this is this F course request is an action. A, uh, we'll see a motion and a second. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. I move that the board of school directors approve the staff conferences listed under Part G of the agenda. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Part H, the memorandum of agreement. I move that the Board of School Directors approve the attached memorandum of agreement between the Exeter Township Education Support Professionals and the Exeter Township School District to amend Act 3. Section 7 of the Collective Bargaining Agreement. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Can I just ask who would be the signator for the association? <clears throat> Ross Seiler. Ross Seiler, President Ross. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. That completes personnel. Thanks, Dr. Brender. Uh, student functions, um, Mrs. Kutcher. Item A, just reporting the field trips below the, uh, <clears throat> with, uh, within the 60 mile radius that have been approved. Item B, I move that the uh, Board of Directors approve the following field trip beyond the 60 mile radius, which is the senior high music students requesting to travel <coughs> to New York City on March 21st, 2018 to participate in a Broadway workshop with actors from the show Wicked. Okay. The motion and a second. Any discussion? I've checked on the show Wicked, and it's about the uh, the other witch in the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah. it's neat. So the mob thought it was named after him. <laughs> <laughs> he is the other witch in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> any, any further discussion? Oh, War of Warlock, please. That, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I, uh, All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Item C, I move that the Board of Directors approves the request of Bernadette um, Burkle, scho doctoral scho uh, candidate at Immaculata University, to work with our Director of School Musicals as she conducts research as part of her dissertation. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? What is her dissertation on in school musicals? Uh, when she had asked for the uh, the ability to do that, it had something to do with the uh, impact of the school musicals on student engagement. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Item D, um, I move that the Board of Directors approves a tuition agreement between Hogan Learning Academy, LLC, and the Extra Township School District for Special Education Services for student number 180819 beginning October 2nd, 2017 through the end of 2017-18 school year. The district is not responsible for any cost for this placement. Oh, second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item E. I move that the uh, Board of School Directors approves Extra Eagles Environmental E3 Club as a student activity account. Envirothon is a natural resource environmental education program that combines classroom learning and outdoor activities and this exposure to nature and seeing how humans impact the natural world provide invaluable lessons for understanding ecosystems and our environment and we can read about the rest. <laughs> A motion and a second. Any discussion? Can you tell me who the um, and uh, the um, yeah, the Advisory teachers, advisors. the advisors? Yeah. Lori Sarapparoo. Oh yeah. Oh, Lori Sarapparoo. Sarapparoo. Lori Sarapparoo. Okay. Yeah. Do we already have a fund? We we do. This is just. A, I'm sorry. We do. This is just to open up a student activity account. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. And item F, I'm uh, reporting that student 180808, a senior, has been given permission to attend Extra Township uh, Senior High School as a non-resident student for the 2017-18 school year in accordance with policy 202, eligibility of non-resident students. And that's all. That's an action? No, it's just a report. It says action, so it's, it yeah. should be just a report. Okay. okay. Item 11, uh, curriculum programs, uh, curriculum committee. Mr. Quinter. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Davies has published the uh, final version of the mission and vision statements to all the uh, participants in the uh, Committee, if you have any comments, please get them in soon, or I'll have to do it. So, <laughs> Actually, we're going to post you'll, that you'll tomorrow. Be at work. We're planning on posting it tomorrow so that it can sit for 28 days. Okay. And that's publicly uh, accessible, right? So it's going to be at the library, and it's going to be... In the uh, 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 website. You can. The uh, final the other announcement is uh, next curriculum committee meeting is on 6 November, Monday. Uh, since it will be my last one, uh, I was thinking of having it catered and a, uh, and a bar. <laughs> but, uh, exactly. still looking <laughs> into that. but we'd like maximum attendance, and if it's not here, I'm sorry. Planning on bidding it out. Yeah, personal cost. I'm going to pay for it. Thank you, Mr. Pointer. Technology Committee. Mrs. Pager. Um. No report. Brooks County IU Board of Directors, Mr. Quinter. No report, sir. Athletic Committee, Mr. Japina. Yes, um, this is a uh, item that we deferred taking an action on in September. It is recommended. Uh, actually, we did we deferred to take uh, further clarification. And, and Dr. Phelps, I will ask you uh, if you connected with Tom, which I believe you did. I did. So I'll read the motion and you can just fill the board in about the administrative regulations that you talked about. It's recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the establishment of a junior high girls lacrosse program for 7th and 8th graders to start in January of 2018. The Board of School Directors authorizes administration to complete the necessary steps, including registration with the PIAA, to establish the team and work with the parent group who will provide all funding and transportation for the team for at least a three-year period. And then at the last board meeting, we had asked, you, you can fill folks in. Uh, I met with uh, Mr. Legath to the board direction that we would have a document or template going forward for these types of requests. So he's presently putting that together, and we would be bringing that to the board for acceptance. 
And the point of the document is to, in effect, take a three-year period when we approve something that's new <clears throat> to, to ensure that we continue to have booster involvement, that we continue to have uh, enrollment in the activities, and so that uh, a program that gets that parents have come and pitched to us where they've told us that we'll fully support it and we're not asking you for anything, we just want to be authorized so we can compete competitively in PIAA, so we're kind of taking their word at it and basically saying, sure, we'll approve that for you, but we're going to take a three-year moratorium and investing anything back into the program till we look at booster club support, uh, participation in the program, and those sorts of things. And the document will include those minimum specifications. I'm sorry, did we, re did we receive a second on that? No, we didn't. Give it a second. Give it a second. Okay, any further discussion? Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Legislative liaison, township liaison, Mr. Quinter. No report, sir. Brooks Career and Tech Center, Joint Operating Committee, Mr. DeSier. So you had an auction of the house that was successful, they made a profit. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, there's a student-built house in it. There's a, uh, there's, there's a piece of land that the, uh, the Berkshire and Technology Center bought some 20 years ago. And there are still, believe it or not, the subdivision still has 27 lots left. So they build a house every two years. Is this an oldie? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, just up like uh, to an adjacent road to Friedensburg where the, uh, where the school is. Okay. But... Uh, this is the third year in a row that they that the house has won the parade of homes in Berks County. Yeah, it's really it's 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 really a wonderful project. And what they have recently done was they've taken any of the associated shops from the West Campus, which is the one up by the airport, mm -hmm. and they're going to move them out there because these are the kids that work on the house. So it just makes sense that those shops should be located where the house is. Uh, but uh, it's it's. If you, when you see it, you would just be amazed at the amount of talent that's there. And, uh, and as I recall, a couple of years ago, we held a board meeting at yes. BCTC. And yes. I wanted, and you are certainly welcome to do that again. Well, I was wondering. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool to be able to see um, what they did and have a tour of the facility. Um, what they start doing, what we do now, before every meeting, uh, after the dinner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but before before every meeting, now we uh, we have a tour of, the, of an individual shop, and they will invite students uh, to the shop. They have a very <laughs> successful welding program, yeah. and and I'll tell you, I did not realize it, but welds welders are certified by the degree of the weld and the thickness of the metal. So there was a graduate there that had that had five certifications when he left school. His second year out of school, he made $106,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I only bring that up because I get concerned that, we st that the old stigma is still tied to the tech school. Uh, you know, the stigma where kids that can't be successful at school, that's where we send them. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, if kids have an aptitude, if they have a mechanical aptitude and a gift with their hands, you can make a good living. And you know what? Not only can you make a good living, but you can get started without a whole bunch of student loans. So I, I really think that it's a viable alternative uh, for kids, and I just hope that we continue as good a job as we do in promoting it with our students so that they know the opportunity to stay. Last year, Russ, they did a marketing piece that I thought was pretty effective yeah. with listing the students and the schools that they, the home schools that they came from, and what they studied and where they were going. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, isn't it so, uh, Russ, that many of the students from, from the, the technology school, they win national awards oh. for uh, outstanding, for, uh, you know, outstanding what it, whatever they're doing. They always exam. take national championships and state yes. championships. In fact, the last four years, there's been a team of two that wins the Philadelphia Auto Competition. And it's an auto mechanics and a diagnostic, diagnostic competition. And, and I'll tell you what, first prize is like $30,000 worth of tools. Wow. 
and these kids bring this stuff home. There's some great things going out there and just great opportunities. And, and like I said, I just hope that we continue to relay those opportunities to the students here next. Thank you, Mr. Deacon. The facilities committee, Mr. Brady. I'm going to be working on scheduling a date for our next facilities committee meeting. I will coordinate with Mrs. Geish and send an email out to everyone that's on the committee. I'm looking at either the 8th or the 13th of November. I don't know if Mrs. Geish is he possible to look at those dates now by a chance to see if there's any conflicts. Board complex. You said the eighth and the thirteenth. The eighth is free. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go with that then? Um, if possible, I'd like to have the meeting the in the senior high school. Yes, please. The senior high at what time to start? Um, typical six thirty. Six thirty. Okay. We'll end by eight thirty. Go later than eight thirty. Did you say the eighth? Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Doesn't matter. <laughs> we don't have a meeting so long as two hours. So if anyone in the audience or anyone they know would like to come and join us on November 8th, it will be the most exciting thing you'll do for two hours that evening. Um, we will be going through the preliminary ideas, hopefully, that Mr. Perzilli will bring forth for the upcoming budget season and get an early preview on the season. Um, and also at the same time, hopefully we'll be able to take a tour of the building to see how we're doing on the stage and off, including our basketball court and other facilities. Uh, where's that high school? Yes, high school. 6.30, we'll open up in the conference room. Rumor is we'll be adding a second and third story to the dugout. <laughs> Shh, the elevators. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Brady? That's it this time, thank you. Thank you. Water committee. Um, the audit is finished, and I guess, Ann, we're just waiting for some updates with Maley or something, and then we should have, in November, probably, get the audit committee right. together. Well, yeah, I'm waiting for the draft, uh, and there's some narrative that I have to finish once I get the, the draft of the numbers, and then, yeah, November is our, our target, so I'll report to you as soon as I get that. Okay, thank you. And I also wanted to say when I said the technology committee, I will say today I was at a meeting with um, Dr. Miller, uh, the, the principals of, at, the, at the high school and the junior high, and um, Dr. Davis, I don't think you were there either, Dr. Davis? Yeah. And uh, it, it was about personalized learning <laughs> and the blended cyber school that we're going to be having, at, I think, is it? Is it January of 1819, we're starting out in, 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 with some of the cyber school. Um, our own. Be, the course is that we'll be, we're working on building, and then we're going to be piloting in come September 2019. They'll yeah. be ready for the course catalog January 2019, and the students will be taking the courses from that um, from September 2019. So it's a two year process. Yeah. I mean, it is going to be absolutely fantastic. What Exeter will be offering the students here at, at, at you know at the junior high and I guess it's junior high and senior high we're going to be working on. But it is going to be absolutely fantastic this personalized learning and um, uh, you know I know if people are asking about our own cyber school well it, 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 there's a lot of logistics involved in, in it all and um, Dr. Miller and you know Dr. Dr. Uh, um, Phillips. Phillips. <laughs> Dr. Phillips are doing a great job in, in getting it all together. So I just wanted to report on that, too. Thanks, Mrs. Pagent. Uh, payment requests, uh, Mrs. Pagent? Yes. Uh, we have payment requests for uh, October 2017. A total list of payments in, from the general fund was $987,704.64. And from the capital account, 
$11,518.50. I move that we pay our bills. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Page. Mm -hmm. uh, Superintendent's report, Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Hamburger. The fall season, the fall sports season is coming to a close. As usual, most of our teams are, are in there fighting to make playoffs, districts, and move on to states. As previously stated, the comprehensive plan will be on display tomorrow in the administration building, in the library, as well as on our website. Uh, October 9th, we had an in-service that focused on our personalized learning, which is part of that comprehensive plan. That was one of the uh, hot topics that was on the focus. Uh, we received some really great news um, last Tuesday. Uh, Lorraine has earned the title of High Achievement Award for the 16-17 school year, and will read Title I High Achievement Award for the 16-17 school year, and will receive the 2017-2018 Title I Distinguished School Award. Uh, the Character Counts Program, Improving Our Community Through Caring, Citizenship, and Cooperation. With hearts as big as Texas, staff and students from the Exeter Township School District Riften School collected money for the flood-ravaged Kingwood Branch Library in Kingwood, Texas. The money was raised as a caring response to Hurricane Harvey's destruction and totaled over $830. 100% of the donations collected will be used to purchase brand new books for the school's library. Fall Fun Day was held at Watton Creek on Saturday by our APT. It was well organized and was a huge success. We featured a hay ride, pumpkin patch, pumpkin decorating, a DJ, slap shot from the Reading Royals, a moon bounce, the fire company, a police canine demonstration, magician, and many more games and activities. As well, the Trout in the Classroom project is set to go with the eggs of the fish arriving the first week of November. That is the extent of my report for today. Next, Dr. Phillips. Any other matters from board members? Can I, Dr. can I confirm that we're having a community forum? Oh, I'm sorry. I should, is that announced? Yes. October 24th, it'll be in the Reifton School. I'm um, starting at 6 o'clock, I believe. How will we be advertising this? 7, I'm sorry, 7. Um, as we do all our advertisements, it will go out across our website, our in the newspaper, I believe, right? <coughs> it will be rather well, advertised it in the paper, yeah. But we will be doing that, and it is on the website. Can can it go through the phone system? Is uh, that possible? That? Sure, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Hamburger. I would just like to thank uh, you and the administration for the uh, very informative presentation. That many of us attended last night on the transgender um, issue. Um, I appreciate the, um, Mr. Lockinger's colleague's presentation. I thought it was very informative, and I look forward to the next discussion on that, which I believe is October 30th. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, I heard last night that the presentation on the 30th would start at 6 o'clock. Yes. Uh, the newspaper, I think, incorrectly had 6.30. Okay, we can put that chart Perfect. Mr. Lee, we'll move on. Accept the motion for adjournment. That was for you. So moved. For a second. Thank you. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you.